The right habits put you in control of your health, relationships, mindset, and more. But most people lack the tools to stick with those habits long enough to see results. That is about to change. Welcome to the Unshakable Habits Podcast with your host, habit change specialist and speaker, Stephen Box. Join us each week as experts share their stories, experiences, and insights and give you the tools to build unshakable habits so you can live life on your terms. It's time to take your habits from unsustainable to unshakable. Hey, welcome to the Unshakable Habits Podcast. I am your host, Stephen Box, and today I am joined by Darren LaCroix. Darren, welcome and thank you for joining me today. Hey, Stephen, uh, big fan of yours and what you're doing and happy to help. Thanks for inviting me. Well, the, uh, the feeling is definitely mutual. I am also a big fan of yours. Before we jump in, I do want to remind everyone of the unshakable habits that we're looking at here, the framework that we want to kind of put these stories into. So we want to look at what was the vision or the goal that really set everything into motion? What were the skills that Darren had to develop in order to reach that goal? And then finally, what actions did he have to take to actually develop those skills? So as you're hearing Darren's story today, keep a lookout for those three parts because that's what's going to allow you to take what Darren did and apply it to your own life. Mm. So Darren, you have this great story and I don't think most people would expect that you have it. Because when they look at you, they see world <laughs> champion of public speaking. They see the only, literally the only person in the entire world who is an accredited speaker, a certified speaking professional, and a world champion of public speaking. The only one. Who would have ever guessed that your first business was an absolute failure? <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, that's where we want to start at because I think that's where a lot of people are when they're trying to create unshakable habits in their life. They're at a point where they're struggling, especially struggling to stick with those habits. Now, I know you said in the past that your dream when you were younger was to make people laugh. So how did you go from having this dream of wanting to make people laugh to being a business owner, which isn't funny at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it can be funny. <laughs> Just not for the right reasons. So, yeah, I, when I was eight years old, I, I used to be enamored with my brother and cousin who were naturally funny people. The people that in your family at the holiday gatherings, they have everybody laughing and you know recapping Saturday Night Live from that weekend or the hot comedian that's going on right now. And they just be redoing their material and have everybody laughing. And as an eight year old, I was so enamored with that. And I thought that was like so cool that they could bring such joy to people. And I remember it was like a Polish side of the family. We're at the kids table, the rickety card uh, card table you know, that they threw a tablecloth over. And I stood up and I threw out a punchline and I hushed my own family. And people like looking at me and I remember being eight years old and sliding down in my chair thinking that was painful. I will never, ever try to do that again. And I didn't, you know, I'm funny. Isn't my thing. Okay. New lane. And so through high school and then college, I realized my passion and love for business. So after four years of business school, I went to Bryant college. It's now called Bryant university, but Graduated there in 88 and I was all excited and I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I had my own little business during college and it was a um, landscaping business. It was a driveway ceiling. Some people in the South don't know what that means, but it basically means you paint your driveway to seal out all the water so it doesn't crack. Anyway, the challenge was, and it grew for three years while I was in college. The challenge was that's a seasonal business and you can't do that in New England in the winter. It's just a summer thing, which was perfect for college. So I looked for the business and I found 
uh, a Subway franchise was growing rapidly, the fastest growing franchise in the country at that point. And they had 5,000 stores. And I said, this is perfect, but it was growing from Western Massachusetts across to East. And I was right in the center of the state. So it was new and I was excited. I'm going to own a multi multiple stores. I'm going to be a multimillionaire. And I opened my first shop. I got a, a loan and it was kind of crazy, but they gave me the money, had a friend help secure the note. And about a year and a half later, I had to sell it at a loss and I was devastated. And it was painful at the time, but it was the most important transformation of my life because I was then at the lowest point, living with mom and dad, still had my college loans. Now I had a business loan, but I didn't have the business anymore. I was still responsible for that note, but I didn't even have the business to pay it off. So here I am as a telemarketer trying to pay the bills, pay mom and dad rent, pay down on my debt. I had nothing. And I was driving down the road listening to Brian Tracy, and he asked a question. He said, what would you dare to dream if you knew you wouldn't fail? And I thought, I'd be a comedian. How cool would that be? Make an audience laugh for a living. That would be the ultimate. But all of a sudden, the doubt, the, the voice of reason said, but you're not funny, Darren. And that was true. But that wasn't the question. The question was, what would you dare to dream if you knew you wouldn't fail? And so for me personally, I said, you know what? I want to just try it once. It wasn't this big dream. It wasn't this passion. It was I couldn't live my life with the regret of wondering what if. What if Brian Tracy was right? I had nothing to lose. I, you know, I lived at home with mom and dad as a college grad, and it was embarrassing. So I just, I just said, you know what? I'm going to try this. But even more importantly, I'm going to have no regrets. I'm going to go all in. And I think... You know, that's part of the, the, the foundation of the unshakable habits. Are you all in? Are you committed? And so I said, I'm just going to do it once, but I'm going all the way. Because the worst thing about regret is wondering what if. Well, I tried it once, but I was drunk. You know, I saw so many other people try for their first time. They had to get drunk to have the guts to go up there. And I was like, I would still wonder what if. So I made a determination. I, it's just going to be all me. I'm going up 100% sober. I might win by it. I might lose by it. It's going to be painful, but I'm doing this once, but I'm doing it right. So I had never even been to a comedy club in my life. So I decided that what I was going to do was ask a comedian. Well, boom, here's unshakable habit number one. Who are you getting the habit from? Who are you listening to? And so my friends and family told me I was crazy and stupid, but I said, well, let me ask someone who has actually achieved the level that I want to achieve. So I went into a little comedy club in Worcester, Massachusetts, near where I live. The comedian that night, the headliner, his name was Chris McGuire. He's still a writer in Hollywood. Funny guy. Anyway, I worked up all the courage I could to uh, talk to him after the show because I'm a quiet, shy kid. And I said, hi, my name is Darren. I want to try this. What do I need to do? And he asked me a question. He said, are you funny? I said, no. He said, good. I'm like, good? What do you mean good? And it shocked me that he said good, but now he had my attention. So now I'm curious. What do you mean? And he went on to explain that, you know, people like my brother and cousin who, you know, can make the family laugh, your friends laugh. He said, that's one skill set. He said, but if you gave most of them a microphone, if you handed them a microphone and put them in front of a group of 100 strangers, they couldn't make them laugh. He said, but that's a different skill set. But that skill set can be learned. And it was like a Scooby-Doo moment. <gasps> you know, what? What? And But he handed me an ounce of hope. And he said two things. Number one, get the book. I'm like, book? There's a book about stand-up comedy? Well, of course, there's books about everything. But there's also a thousand books on everything. But here's a guy who was where I wanted to be and said, get this book. So I got this book. The best thing I had going for me, Stephen, is I knew that I didn't know. My ego was zero problem at that point. That, that'll happen later. But at that point, it was zero problem. And I think if you're trying to get that vision of where you want to be and who you want to be, like whose advice are you taking? Who are you listening to? Whose habits are you, you, know, are you following? Because there's a lot of bad habits 
and a lot of easy habits. And so he said two things. Number one, get the book. So I went and got the book, Judy Carter, Stand Up Comedy, the book. He said, number two, you need to go to open mic nights and watch other people just starting out. You know, sometimes we compare ourselves to somebody else's end result, which is not fair. Don't you dare compare. It's not fair. You know, you can't compare. You can't even compare your beginning to somebody else's beginning, but at least it's, you know, gives you a realm of uh, possibility. And so on Sunday night, I went to a little comedy club and called Stitches. It used to be right outside of Fenway Park in Boston. And I, you know, sticky floor, could smell the stale beer. I thought, this is cool. And I watched people go up for their first time and they were horrible, horrible. And I thought I could do that. It inspired me. And so I studied for two months in April 20, uh, April 22nd, 1926, 1992, Stitches. Two months later, I brought my friends with me because I was afraid I was going to chicken out. And I just said, I'm just doing this once. I am never doing this again, but I'm going all in. So I told my friends, I kid you not, I don't usually tell this part of the story, but you know, your friend. And I told them, I said, I might cry or whine like a baby. You make sure I go up there. I don't care if I scream, if I run out, tackle me and bring me back in. But I'm going up tonight. I need your help. And they did. And because I knew they would do that for me, because they love me, that I, you know, I, I forced myself to go up and it was ugly. It was horrible. I don't know if you want to show the clip. Um, that's up. Yes, we, we, yeah, we, we can go and show the clip. So if, if you're listening to this on audio, you're only going to hear it. I would encourage you to go over to the YouTube channel and actually watch this video. Even if you just fast forward to this part. Does anyone here live in New England? Yeah. 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 I, had, I figured I had to get something. Did anybody ever notice that any every other small town in New England takes one little small historical fact and makes it the greatest event in the world? <laughs> Sorry for my voice, like fluctuating. But uh, a lot of towns are like this. Uh, I did. I, I was doing some research. Like places like Lexington, you know, the first um, revolutionary skirmish happened there. Um, what was his name? I can't even think of his name. Obviously, he was real famous. Eli Whitney was in Westboro. You know, born in Westboro. Um, I was doing some research, and I discovered that the the actual the first dentist to use ether actually happened in Charlton, Massachusetts. And an interesting thing about this was he actually experimented himself. You know, nobody else had done this before. And, and he, he started with animals and he used his own dog. That's enough pain. I'll bring us back. Yeah. And the funny part was that that wasn't even the worst part. Somebody, the, the person running the video camera, it got clipped off and it was just embarrassing. My hands are shaking if you look close and I'm checking my notes. And I remember I told one joke and I was so nervous that sometimes when you have that outer body experience that what you're doing and saying is not in sync with your body language. And I said this, I was telling this joke about the first rocket launch in history happened in my hometown because I was making fun of towns in, in New England who every town in New England, when you drive into the town, it's like, this is where George Washington slept. And this is where George Washington had a splinter. You know, there is all these crazy little things. I can make fun of that. But then I made the irony where my town really did have the claim to fame. And I was talking about Dr. Goddard's rocket launch. The first liquid fuel rocket in history was launched in my hometown. And I said the rocket took off and it went vertically. And those of you just listening to the audio, I did horizontal with my arm, but I said vertical. And at that instant, I was so disgusted with myself that I just reacted. And I said, ah, shoot. That's not the actual word I used, but I swore, used profanity. Sorry, mom. I swore, ah, ah, shoot. And everybody laughed. And I was like, what happened? Why did you laugh? That's not where you're supposed to laugh, but I'll take it. And that was the only real laugh I got that night. There was some pity laughs in there, but that was the only real laugh. I remember walking off stage and this other comedian trying to console me, putting his arm around me. He said, don't worry, man. It's just your first time. And I remember thinking, don't worry. Did you see what I did? I got a laugh. 
I mean, it was an accident, but I'll figure out how to reproduce it. I'll get rid of everything that didn't work and figure out how to reproduce more mistakes. I can do this. And that's Steven, that's where the vision was born. And I didn't care how long it took. I just, I knew I was going to figure it out. Cause I just, I, I got, I'm on no time frame here. Uh, I'm at the lowest point in my life. And I, I looked at it, you know, because a lot of kids grow up and they want to be high school athletes. I understand that's a great goal. I was not going to have that goal. I was already past my college days. I couldn't even make the team barely in high school. And when I looked at people's careers, athletes, you know, five, six, seven, eight years is a long career. And then you're done. You worked all that your life and you're done. And I, when I was looking into this and reading about it and studying it, reading the books, I realized George Burns was like a hundred. I was 23. I had like 70 years to go that I could work on this. So even if it took me 20 years, I would be okay with that. And honestly, that was my thought process. I didn't care. It was like an instant addiction. I like, I want that again. You know, shoot me up again. Give me that laughter thing. Uh, I want to figure this out. I, I have so many notes that I just took just from that first question. But a couple things that really stood out to me the most is there at the end, you talked about how you come off the stage and the comedian's like, he's ready because he's like, this guy's going to be bummed, right? And you're, he's trying to console you and you're like, what are you talking about? I just gotta laugh. That was so awesome. I think so many times we'll do one thing right and 10 things wrong. And we spend all of our time focused on the 10 things we did wrong. And we never build upon the one thing we did right. And it's such a common mistake that we make where we allow ourselves to get built, get just torn down off those mistakes. And we don't think about, man, I actually did something right. I have something to build upon here. Mm -hmm. The other thing I, that I heard you say that I found interesting, a lot of times when I see people struggling with something, so whether it's they want to lose a certain number of pounds or they want to make a certain amount of money, the goal is always I have to do this as soon as humanly possible. And fast and good quality hardly ever go together, right? And you said, I was not on a time frame. I was at the lowest point in my life. Most people would say, I have to do this now because I'm at the lowest point in my life. What do you think it was that allowed you to have that mindset of saying, you know what? Things can't get any worse. I might as well just take my time and try to get this right. Well, I think part of it was the fact that my whole life I was told I can't. So when Brian Tracy asked that question, I went back to that eight-year-old kid. Like I skipped over most of my life and went to the eight-year-old kid who was enamored with seeing people laugh. And the idea of me being able to incite that in people, that is crazy. Oh, I can? Like I didn't care. So part of it was that knowing what drove me, knowing what inspired me. Uh, that was definitely part of it. And and this is, I want to give Tony Robbins credit. He said a lot of people put their short-term goals too low. Excuse me, their short-term goals too high. So they don't hit it in the short term and they think they're a failure. And they put their long-term goals too low that they could achieve so much more. And it comes down to, Stephen, what you talk about, unshakable habits. If you have the unshakable habits, nothing can stop you. There's some breakthroughs you're going to need. But that's exactly what the unshakable habits are designed for. So I wish I could tell you I knew where it came from. I think it was, number one, that instant addiction that it was just I could do the impossible. I didn't know what or how I did it, but I I did it once. I'll figure it out again. And then I think it was just the fact that at that point in my life, I was bombarding myself with motivational tapes. When I was in a car... I didn't even know if my radio worked. I was listening to motivational tapes. Brian Tracy, Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, um, you name it. Jim Rohn, anyone I could get my hands on. 
and I would listen again and again and again to the same programs. Thanks to my, you know, my high school buddy, Jim Boland, who introduced me to it. That was like it. I was loving it because all they do is tell you, you can. Well, eventually you're going to accept that if you listen to it enough. So I think that was part of where that came from. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that. I actually have used something similar. Like when I do my workouts, all of my workout playlists start with this audio that I downloaded off a YouTube video. What somebody did is they took parts of speeches from Eric Thomas, from Will Smith, and from a guy that I know you just had the pleasure of interviewing for your podcast, Les Brown. Yep. And they put this like epic music on it and i just sit there and listen to it it wasn't it wasn't about the music it wasn't about you know oh this is my favorite song or anything else it was listening to the words that they were saying they got me mentally in the right mindset to go and do my workouts and, and so when you say that it's like that's the first thing that popped my mind so often i think we we get so reliant on high energy stuff to get us motivated. But I think it's the stuff that really touches us. that gets us to think deeper. That's what really motivates us. Not, not just high energy stuff. Yeah. For me, you know, my comedy mentors, they're the ones when I, I was any mentor I can, every class that I can, every book that I could, I was a sponge. As you know, I talk about that. Well, one of the things I kept hearing over and over that was common, from every Vegas, excuse me, every Boston headliner at that time, I live in Vegas now, but every Boston headliner, every class that I took, the one thing I kept hearing over and over and over again was stage time. Never turn down stage time. It's that experience time. It's not the comedy writing. Like you got to do that, but it's putting yourself in that experience. It's not talking about the workout. It's not preparing the workout. It's doing the flipping workout. Well, for what I wanted in my vision, it was actually getting up on stage. When I had, at the beginning, I had no act, I had no confidence, I had no stage presence, and I wasn't funny. Doesn't matter. I created the habit. And, you know, the habit is critical. But, Stephen, I don't always often talk about this, but just when you brought up the idea of the music and not just the pumping music. So, one of the things that my mentor Vinny told me, was, hey, I don't care if you bomb. I care if you don't go up. If you don't go up, I will never, ever help you again. And he, what he was saying to me is like, you got to go up right now. All that matters right now is you go up there. Nothing else matters. Bombing, people heckling you, people ignoring you, the TV on in the background, doesn't matter. So, Stephen, I would sit at that time. I had a 1976 Volkswagen Rabbit, and I would sit in my little rabbit, and I had a mixtape. Those of you who are younger consider playlist, but it was a mixed cassette tape, and I listened to three songs, and one of them was Right Now by Van Halen. And all so I listened to it. All I needed to do was right now I have to go in there and go up on that stage. And that was one of the songs. And ironically, Stephen, you know, I'm writing a, a new book now. I listen to right now again because it resonates with me now as I drive to the lake where I do my writing. So I, I do it out at Lake Las Vegas. But as I'm driving there, I listen to that one and Dreams I'll Never See, which is a Molly Hatchet song, the live version, because it gets me going. But then back in the 1994, um, well, excuse me. This was 92, 93, 94. Anyway, all in that, I was listening to this every time. One of my college buddies, his name, I have, still have it on my desk. His name was Silverio Arujo. And Silverio was one of my close college buddies. And he was the life of the party type of guy. Well, a year after we graduated college, he was in Portugal where his, um, um, where his family was from. And he was the healthiest person he knew. Uh, he had just got married, married his college sweetheart. They just had a baby and he had an aneurysm in the middle of the night and died. And there in my mind, 
there became this void in the universe because he was that you just when he came in walked in the room he just lit up the room and i said there's a void in the world now it might just be my world but there's a void in the world now i need to step up and fill that void so one of the other songs that i listened to was uh, boys to men it's uh, i'll lose my man card for this boys to men and mariah carey uh, i think the title is one fine day one sweet day one so sweet i've day. lost my man card now too apparently so one sweet day so all right don't share this maybe we shouldn't stream this yeah so, we'll just cut this part out for later not really but you know. <laughs> well at least now people at least know we're thinking and, about it and i thought of essay when i listened to that song and i'm like i I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I got to go up. I got to fill that void. So it was like that energy that knowing what the unshakable habit was, which was to go up just to go up. You know, I love if anybody's watching this or listening to this, you know, the, there's a brilliance in the movie. We bought a zoo where you only got to be brave for five seconds. You know, once I'm up there, I could panic. I could pee in my pants. I could do whatever, but I'm up there. <laughs> That's the, that's the goal. So anyway. Yeah, I, I, ironically, I'm working on the movie script for it. And I wrote a scene in which was also true that I was in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and I took a comedy class because I took all of them in uh, at Periwinkles in uh, downtown Providence. And I was in the bathroom. And I kid you not, I was so nervous. I didn't pee in my pants. But I was washing my hands. It was one of those faucets that's like, Psh! and it just sprayed all over my crotch. And so, and I'm going up in five minutes, and I'm like over at the blow dryer, like <laughs> trying to dry my pants. And even though it wasn't pee, I was like, oh man, are you kidding me? So little, little uh, story from the road. Anyway. I, I think I think we've all been there. I think we've all been there. <laughs> That's, that's the re relatable part. So, so you go, you go up on stage, and, and you completely bomb, but you get a little bit of inspiration because you got that one laugh. And you, you already talked a little bit about some of the skills because you, you said you took all the classes you could take, you seeked out all the mentors, you read all the books, you did all of those things. Was there ever a point where you kind of sat down and said, "What do I need to develop?" or did you just kind of depend on the classes and, and the books and everything to tell you what skills you need to develop? Was there ever a point <laughs> or was there a point every day where I was like, what, you know, because at the beginning, my trajectory was so low. So, you know, some people were, you know, boom, they just go up. Mine was so low and so incremental. You know, I, I always say when you get coaching, and when you get direction, you know, your growth goes from incremental to exponential. Well, because I had no act, I wasn't funny. I had no stage presence. I was panicking. It was so incremental that there were many days I, I couldn't even see my own growth. And I think that's one thing to bring up, Stephen, is the fact that, you know, the friends that you know are on your team, be careful who you tell what your crazy idea is, because it's very easy for people close to you to talk you out of it. But if you know you got somebody who is your brother, your sister, and I mean, I don't mean your blood brother or sister, but your bro brother or sister who's got your back, tell them to point out your growth. Uh, you know, our friend Amanda Mae Gray, she has a great quote that I love. She says, you can't see your own progress during the progress. You can't see your own progress. So for our friends who are Toastmasters, you know, I tell Toastmasters, you got to tell everybody in your club when you see them growing, like point it out because they can't see it. And if someone's pointing it out to us, we'll keep going. But if we think we're getting nowhere, which we all think we're getting nowhere, that's the biggest challenge. So we need the people around us, encourage them to help us point out our own growth. Um, anyway, so many stories come to mind. We just got to know that we're growing because we're doing the habit but the problem as you know Stephen, is the plateau when 
you, yeah, when you when you see your obvious growth and your obvious uptick and you you get that breakthrough, it's easy to keep going after that. It's on the plateau where seemingly you're staying the same, but you're not. You're moving forward to get to that next breakthrough, but we don't yeah. see it during that time. Yeah, I, I've had that conversation with people before where when people see my before picture and they say, man, you lost 80 pounds. How did you do that? I'm like, that's not the right question. I, I did that by eating better and, and working out. The better question is, how did I manage to keep going after plateauing six different times? That's the question. And that's, I think so many times people overlook that because it's like you said, we get focused on the moment. They, we see a little bit of the progress happening. We can, people tell us, oh yeah, you're getting better at this or, or whatever. And so we see it. And then the moment that stops, we kind of fall off. Amen. So now you... You went on to become a professional comedian, which means that people actually thought you were funny enough to pay you for it. Yeah. Well, I never reached a headliner status. I headlined a couple shows because somebody didn't show up, which is how you move up in ranks. But I, you know, I discovered the world of speaking and I did both for many years. And I just realized down the road, I'm a speaker. I have the greatest foundation ever, which is doing stand up. But I just, for me personally, I have a lot of great friends who are comedians. They're awesome. It's just not who I was. I was more the corporate guy because I went to college and that's where I was comfortable. But for me personally, it drained my soul to be in a comedy club for six or seven nights in a week, you know, just being around drunks and people drinking. And I'm not a drinker. That's not, not my thing. Um, I don't have a problem with people who do, but being around that and the, you know, the penis jokes every night and the, the fart jokes, and just like, this is just not that encouraging. But for me being in the speaking world, like I can go to a seminar, nobody can know me. I can sit there and it could be an average motivational speaker up there and I'll get something from it. Cause that's my, that's my jam. That's my home, if you will. And so I love seeing other people and I love seeing the mistakes they make. So then I can go train uh, my students in that as well, but I'll find something because that's like where I live. Um, I don't know if you ever heard the story, Stephen, but when I went to my first NSA convention, uh, it was a whole new world for me. You know, now I'm in a land of 2000 people who do what I do and want to do what I do. And I just, I remember seeing the opening keynote speaker, his name, uh, was Captain Gerald Coffey, and he just, he's a prisoner of war. He gave this amazing speech, and there was, there was music after, and this guy, Ken Needema, who played the piano, he recapped the speech brilliantly. He's a blind pianist, and he does it at conventions and conferences. I was like in tears. I'm like, and I literally took a notepad and broke into the pool at the hotel I was staying at, and I wrote a seven-page letter to my mom that said, for the first time in my life, I feel like I found home. Mm. And I never really had that in the comedy world. I was like, this is, I don't know what or how or what my career is going to look like or what I'm going to do, but for the rest of my life, these are my people. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned the story, and I think something that people might miss if they're not paying attention here is you had this initial dream. You wanted to make people laugh. And in the beginning, your thought was the only way to really do that is to be a stand-up comedian. Yep. And you went and you lived that life and you lived that dream. And then you realized, okay, this isn't quite right. But you didn't at that point say, well, maybe my dream was stupid. Maybe I just, I did the wrong thing. Instead, you shifted and you said, okay, where else can I go be funny? Because you enjoyed being up on stage, you enjoyed the stage time, you enjoyed making people laugh, you just didn't enjoy the environment. So you found a way to go put yourself in the environment, you just shifted your focus. Your dream still stayed the same, you just shifted the way that you delivered it. Yeah, I, I can't even say that I, my thought process was exactly that way. Um, I did both for many years, still thinking I wanted to be a comedian. But when I finally found 
speaking and it was actually at like a Zig Ziglar conference that my company had sent me to and the people from NSA New England were working the table in the back of the room and I met this woman Rosemary Berry and I told her I was working on being a comedian and someone said you got to talk to Rosemary she's a humorist I'm like what's a humorist and they're like, well, it's a corporate speaker. I'm like, what's a speaker? I mean, here I am at a Zig Ziglar conference and it never dawned on me, Zig, that's his career. Like, didn't even, not on my radar screen. So when she explained it to me and she said, well, you know, people want a message, which I didn't know on the surface was important to me. But later on, I realized I cared more about the aha than the ha ha. So I, I didn't know there was a bigger, better dream for Darren. Uh, but when I found out they're going to be sober, they're going to, they want a message and they're going to pay me 10 times as much. I was like, what? Say that again? Rewind? Are you kidding me? 10 times as much? I don't have to be as funny. You know, and that's the thing. It's like when I realized I really wasn't a comedian you know, you could say I was a failure because I never became a household name. I never became a uh, a headliner in Boston on the circuit. If if I stuck around for a few more years, I might have got there, but it wasn't who I was. It wasn't resonating with my heart. So I'm thankful for the journey because it set me up um, perfectly for speaking. It was the greatest foundation. So it wasn't like, ooh, I need something else. It was like, here's something else that's more suited for you. And so kind of paralleled both of them for quite a while. And then I just eventually, then later on, I realized I, it's draining my soul to be in a comedy club. I, so I didn't recognize what was happening. You know, a lot of times when we're in the middle of it, we don't recognize it. Just like you're in the middle of progress, you don't recognize it. You're in the middle of devastation. Sometimes you don't recognize it. And I was just having my soul drained um, because of the environment. And now you know, speaking motivation seminars get me jacked up, you know, even if I'm not the one on stage. Anyway, long answer. No, no, you're good. So it's interesting because you mentioned how coaching takes us from that incremental growth to just exponential growth. And I think that's really a great point, especially when we look at it in the context of it does it's not just about growth, right? It's about when you're going the other way too. Because like you said, we don't realize sometimes why we're struggling when we're struggling, just like we don't realize just how much we're actually growing. So having a coach to come along and say, hey, keep doing more of this. This is actually good. This is where your strength is. Is just as important as having someone to come along and say, stop doing that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We all need our Yoda. Yeah, because sometimes we, we just don't know to stop doing stuff. <laughs> we don't, well, we don't know what is really effective and what isn't because we just don't understand from that coach's perspective, from the coach's eye. Well, you know my story. When I finally met Mark Brown in 2001, that changed everything for me because I had that coach who, you know, it's one thing to read a book. It's another thing for somebody to say, hey, you and your style, when you do this, this is the problem you're creating. It makes it worse. You know, a book doesn't necessarily reach out and touch. Look, books are good. It's direction. It's a starting point. But as you know, I say, Stephen, we need direction and correction. Whether it's a mentor or a coach or that person who can look at our situation and care enough to say, okay, tell you the truth. You know, some people, you can't handle the truth. A lot of people can't handle the truth. But for those people who are truly struggling and truly want to get where they need to go, like you need a coach. And it's not just a coach and whatever your subject is, whatever your unshakable habit area is in. It's like there's a difference between a high school coach and an Olympic coach. There's a difference between a high school athlete and an Olympic athlete. I want the Olympic coach. They're going to beat me up. It's going to hurt. But I'm going to get way better than the, the high school coach would ever do for me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just a perfect example, and, and I'm not, I'm just going to go ahead and preface this by saying that I'm not saying anything negative about Toastmasters making this comment, because um, I've been a member of Toastmasters for six years. I know you're still a big part of Toastmasters, but the difference between the feedback I get in my club, even my advanced club, and the feedback that I get from the coaches at stage time 
it's worlds of difference. Mm-hmm. The amount that I've grown in the last, I guess, about 10 months now that I've been a member of Stage Time in comparison to how much I grew in the first five and a half years in Toastmasters, it's I've already grown more in Stage Time. And that's not to say that I didn't have lots of growth in Toastmasters and it didn't benefit me, but it's just once you get around higher caliber coaches, your growth happens much faster. Yeah, because your your habits are in a different lane. You know, your unshakable habits are in a different lane. But, you know, well-meaning people try to help, but they're helping from the level of knowledge that they have. And, like, I, I love James Clear. I don't know if you know him, but James Clear, he says, everyone wants a gold medal. No one wants to train like an Olympian. Everyone wants a gold medal. No one wants to train like an Olympian. And I don't know if you heard this story or not, Stephen, when uh, when I joined the contest in 2001, there's six levels of the contest. So I know you know that. There's six levels of the contest. So it wasn't until level two or three that I was like, I should get a coach, thinking they could just give me some little tweaks. And I met this man named David McElhaney, and I studied him. I was impressed by him. He was he was w- much better at coach and feedback than the average Toastmaster, even though he was a Toastmaster. And he had gone to the semifinals before, and he was really good, and I trusted him. So if you're looking for a coach, you got to find that person that you would actually be open to. Well, Stephen, you never heard this part of the story, but uh, when I won the semifinals, Dave McElhaney was there with me, and that's right when I met Mark Brown. Well, Dave McElhaney walked me over to Mark Brown and said brilliantly, I can't take you to a place I've never been. I can't take you to a place I had never been. So I was going to the world championship, but Dave had never been there. So he kind of handed me over to Mark, who has been there and done that, because it's a different level of coaching. He helped me. I would have never made it to that level without him, but he was wise enough to know okay, now you need another coach who is qualified to help you at that higher level. And with Mark's permission, both of them coached me, but it was a whole different level of feedback. And Dave was still helpful even at the higher level, but Mark knew things that Dave did not know. I remember you uh, sharing the story about the first time that you took your speech to Mark, that you that you wrote, I think it was like two and a half hours he had given you some instruction. You made all these changes. You go up there. You're like, I've got the greatest speech in the world. Mark is going to love this speech. And he's like, Darren, we got some work to do, man. This is it's not what you think it is. Oh, it's, yeah, it was, it, I was so excited as I handed it to him. I swear it was like the, the handing it to a choir of angels. I could hear in the background. And you, you said it very nicely. Mark shook his head, looked at me. Oh, Darren, we have some work to do. And I flipped out. My first reaction is, what? Are you kidding me? I wrote the greatest speech that I could write from the level that I was at. But you don't know what you don't know. And my ego was in the way. So remember I said early on, I had no ego. Well, eventually it grew. <laughs> it got in the way. And I needed to go back to that. 1992 Darren, who was open and eager and willing to learn anything. So I needed the humbling. And it's it's crazy, too, because if you think about the fact that had Dave not been humble himself and realized that he had taken you as far as he could take you, you would have never gotten that humbling. And then you probably would not have performed as well as you did in the finals. Now, not even who's to say, say who's to say if you still could have won or not? We don't know. I do know. But, There's no yeah. way. Yeah. So, but by having that opportunity, and then you did something that a lot of us struggle to do. I know it's something I've struggled with at different times in my life, which is when someone says, this isn't as good as you think it is, what is your reaction? Do you say, what do you mean? Or do you go, okay, what do you got? Let's go to work. Yeah. Do you mean then or now? 
no, 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 when it happens, that's what, that's what I'm saying. It's like, you know, it's, it's that struggle when it happens, right? Like that initial response is so hard. The first time it happened, I didn't know I needed so much help. Now I know. So for example, I just did a new keynote, 17 minutes to your dream at our event called game changers. And when I first brought it to Mike Davis, cause I know now I need a coach. I'll be honest. I want him to say, it's amazing. Maybe just consider this tiny little tweak, yeah. but that ain't what he says. <laughs> you know, when I, I get a list, there's some things, but now I understand that any version 1.0 that's going to happen. Just because I'm passionate, enthusiastic, and animated doesn't mean I'm saying anything. Doesn't mean I'm right. resonating. Doesn't mean I'm leaving that message on the hearts and the minds of my audience. So I take it a lot better. But that little ego is still in there saying, oh, it's just a tiny little tweak. It's never just a tiny little tweak. So yeah. I wish they'd just pat me on the back. I know I need the help. And the... I think what I was kind of pointing out there too is that it's when we talk about taking actions and developing the skills, one of the skills that I think all of us should work on regardless of what it is we're trying to achieve is the skill of accepting feedback. And yeah. it is one of the hardest skills to develop. I even say you've got to get to the point where you can crave it. Crave yeah. it. Not just ask for it. Crave it. But then, uh, you know, we teach, Stephen, you've got to discern, is this thought and felt or is this how to make it better? Thought and yeah. felt or how to make it better. Everyone is qualified to tell you thought and felt. And if 80% of the audience said it was confusing, guess what? It's confusing. It's confusing. Now, that doesn't mean you take their advice on how to make it better. That is the land of the qualified coach. But everyone is qualified to tell you thought and felt. And then you make adjustments based on that, but you're making the adjustments. Yeah. All right. So final thoughts. Do you have a final message that you really want people to, to hear when it comes to creating an unshakable habit in their life? Make sure you're choosing the right habits. Make sure you get that insight from someone who is where you want to be whether just like the guy who was a comedian who said get this book they're coming from a place of knowing what the unqualified uh, what the unshakable habit should be so make sure you're getting advice from people who are literally where you want to be everyone's got an opinion you yeah. don't listen <laughs> so get clear from them on what your unshakable habits are and then you are the CEO of your life. And we've all had times where we know we should have fired our own CEO, even though it was us or yeah. the people who work for us, who was us. So you're the CEO. So make that commitment and then find people to keep you accountable. So you move forward, you know, yeah. and it, you really got to get to know yourself, know what you need to get where you want to go. Know that there's a, there's a time to vent and then complaining is not venting. Once you vent, let it go, shut up and move on. You know, it's a Boston term, shut up, stop moving your lips and take responsibility. You know, until you take 100% responsibility that you are the CEO, nothing's going to change. You can find every excuse you want. You can listen to everybody you want. You can listen to all the negative people. If you've never heard it before, go check out the, uh, the poem by Theodore Roosevelt from 1899 called The Man in the Arena. And sorry, ladies, it's titled The Man in the Arena. It applies to man and woman. Uh, and you are the person in the arena. Make no mistake. But it's it's about the critic. Don't listen to the critic. Yep. And, and you know, sometimes the harshest critic isn't the person outside. Yep. It's the person inside. Amen. Amen. And, and I think going through some of my uh, unshakable keys that I wrote down for, from you today, I think you really hit on a lot of that. You talked about when you were living with your parents, having just lost your business, that you felt that you had nothing to lose. 
And so you were like, you know what? I might as well go out and live with no regrets. So I, you know, I think let's put that same question with a little bit of a spin on it that Brian Tracy asked you. What if you don't do, will you have regrets about when you when you're dying? What are you going to regret in your life if you don't go out and do it? Yeah, what are you teaching your kids? Are you teaching yep. them to quit? Or are you teaching them to move forward anyway? Yep. You also mentioned several times this idea of who are you listening to? You know, had you only talked to your family, you would have never gone up on that stage because no one would have encouraged you. No one would have given you any guidance. You would have literally just said, oh, well. But you... And, and you even said you had to work up the courage just to go even ask the comedian for help. Yep. <laughs> Not even get on stage yet. You just had to work up courage to even go ask somebody for help. And, and I think that's huge because so many times we get caught up in thinking we can do it on our own. And it's okay to be scared to ask for help. It's okay to recognize that you don't even really know what to ask. Mm-hmm. You know, you literally just went up and said, hey, I want to do this. What should I do? You had no expectations about what the answer was going to be. You're just hoping that he's going to give you something actionable. Yep. Amen. You know, then um, one of the other things that you said was about coaching. And I really liked that when you are in the moment, and, and you, you used Amanda's phrase here, when you're in the progress, you can't see it. And then we talked about the exact same thing being true about when there's a struggle, you're blind to it because you're in the moment. Because seeing a struggle is essentially admitting that something you're doing is ineffective. Hmm. And that's difficult for us to accept on our own. You can't, you can't change your ideas and your thoughts with your thoughts and ideas. You have to get it from somewhere else. So lots of really great insights there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. And if uh, any of your listeners need a daily dose of inspiration, I have a free website, 365inspirationalquotes.com. Go check it out, pop in your email address, and I will send you a quote a day, every day for a year. And it starts off the, with the four that were in front of me on my desk when I was chasing that crazy dream. And one of the most important ones was Vincent Van Gogh. He said, if there's a voice, in, if you hear a voice inside your head that says you are not a painter, then by all means paint and that voice will be silenced. So I, in my head, reinterpret that as if there's a voice inside you that says you're not funny, then by all means make them laugh and that voice will be silenced. Love it. You, you read my mind. I was about to ask you how people can get in touch with you. And I'm going to do you a favor. I'm just dot com, DarrenLacroix.com. I've got thousands of videos on YouTube. Be a sponge.com. If you want my top 10 speaking mistakes, if you're a speaker or know a speaker. Um, but yeah, I'm easy to find. Just like the water, Darren LaCroix. No relation. <laughs> no relation. So Darren has not paid me for this. I am doing this for free. Channeling my inner Ford here, putting my disclaimer on this. If you are a speaker or a presenter, go look into Stage Time University. I promise you will not regret it. And you need to listen to the Unforgettable Presentations podcast with Darren and Mark Brown. Thanks. So that, that. That, that's, that's my free before you. We, we do not have any pre agreed payments, but if you want to send some money in the mail, that would be <laughs> Gotcha. Oh, hey, Steven, I love what you're doing. And I hope uh, if you're listening to this, you listen to some other episodes too. Steven's the real deal. I'm a fan. Uh, keep it up, Steven. Thanks, dear. Appreciate that and appreciate you joining us today. And it's hard not to come up with another episode if your brand is Unshakable Habits 
you have to have a habit of creating episodes now. <laughs> Good luck, Stephen Box. Thank you. And, and I'll just add real quick. It's funny that you, you mentioned that, Darren, because you are actually pushing me right now. You started in the Stage Time Facebook group a 77-day video challenge. And you're on day 146, 147. Yep. And I'm on the exact same day. And the reason I'm on the same day is because I'm like, every time I think about, should I just go ahead and stop? I've done enough of these. I see Darren's video pop up. I'm like, I got to do another one. (laughs) I'm sorry, and you're welcome. Yes. So, So, yes, go out and find somebody who will inspire and push you to be a sponge, keep growing, and become unshakable. Thanks for listening to the Unshakable Habits Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, please subscribe at unshakablehabits.com slash YouTube or on your favorite podcast app. You can learn more about Unshakable Habits at unshakablehabits.com. Until next week, be unshakable, my friends.